Espresso is intimidating, the learning curve is steep, and you can often find yourself deeply frustrated. So here's everything I wish I knew when I first started out. In this one, I dive deep into the variables of Espresso, show you a really fun exercise to quickly learn how to taste and evaluate your brews, and teach you how to dial in your shots just by reading the information on the bag. I'm serious. Firstly, don't let this meticulous throw you off. I'll be using it like a regular machine. It's just the only one that I have here in the studio. You don't need anything nearly as advanced to follow along, so let's go. Okay, espresso is not a hobby. It's a way of life. If you aren't already in the rabbit hole, then I recommend you think long and hard if you're ready for the kind of commitment it demands. I'll wait. Okay, enough with the thinking. Get in the rabbit hole. Also, we've thrown in a really cool Easter egg in this video, but more on that a little later on. So the first step to getting good at espresso is having a benchmark. Now, this is optional, but it'll save you a lot of guesswork and time. If you have access to one or more cafes, then go there, try their espresso, and define what good espresso is for you. And that way, you have an idea of what to aim for when you're brewing at home. Better still, get beans from your favorite cafe and try to match or get close to what you experienced there using the techniques I'll be covering in this video. So before we look at the variables of espresso and how they impact the cup, we need to talk about the beans that you plan to use. Okay, so you've got a bag of coffee. Now, how do you get to a decent shot without wasting the entire bag? Yep, espresso is notorious for that. You pull that perfect shot, you're finally dialed in, ready to enjoy the rest of the bag, only to realize it's nearly empty. So here's how you can get very close to dialed in just by looking at your bag of coffee. Well, it'll help to peek inside and look at the beans too. Now, it should be noted that everything that I talk about, at least in this segment of the video, is only relevant to specialty coffee. In simple terms, this is very high quality coffee. It's grown with more care, harvested over multiple sessions to pick only the ripe cherries, processed meticulously, and masterfully roasted to land up in our hands so we can botch the brew. Just kidding. This video should help you avoid that. In general, specialty is more sustainable economically, but also environmentally in some cases. But most relevant to this video is that coffee that falls into this category comes with a lot more information on the bag some of which is really useful. So let's first look at what these are. And when we cover the variables of espresso in the next segment, you'll see how useful they can be in guiding your brewing decisions for a given coffee before you even pull a shot. First, we have roast degree. Simply put, this is dictated by a combination of temperature and time spent in the roaster. You'll see words like medium, light, dark, or things like espresso or filter roast, or even weird terminology like city roast, full city roast, etc. I would say use these as a very rough indicator because one roaster's medium could be another's light or dark. So a much better way to gauge this is to do three things. First, look at the color of the beans, then grind them and check the color again. And lastly, take one good bean, place it on a hard surface like a stone countertop and try to crush it with your thumb and see how easy or hard that is. The darker the color, the darker the roast, and the easier the crush test will be, as these tend to be more porous and brittle. Once you've done this with say five, 10, 15 coffees, you'll get to a point where you'll be able to do a quick visual inspection, crush a bean, and know pretty much how to get in the ballpark of a good shot. It'll feel like a superpower once you get the hang of it. Now the general rule is the darker the roast, the quicker and more easily it'll extract, and the better it'll be at maintaining puck integrity, which basically means that it won't crumble under pressure, unlike this dark roast. It is for this reason that I encourage anyone starting out with espresso to first wrap your head around medium dark and dark roast before attempting anything light. They're a lot more forgiving and look a lot sexier oozing through that bottomless porter filter, and that can be very motivating. Trust me, you'll need this morale boost to weather the light roast storm ahead of you if you so choose to go there. But now onto the next piece of information on the bag, roast date. If you buy commodity coffee or supermarket coffee, then you know that the bag only has an expiry date, unlike a bag of specialty, which will tell you exactly when it was roasted. This is so important to know. Now, you can drink two-year-old coffee and it won't kill you. I mean, James drank coffee from the 30s, seems to be doing okay, but it isn't gonna be a pleasant experience. It'll probably taste like garbage. Listen, I don't mean to be an ageist, but old coffee is dead inside, a shell of what it once was. So freshness in coffee is kind of important and even more so with espresso. Too fresh and the CO2 built up in the roasting process is going to mess with your extractions and yield pretty erratic results shot to shot. Too old and you'll struggle to even get up to nine bars of pressure without grinding insanely fine, at which point it's just channeling like mad. So yeah, 
This is very important information, but what is too old or too fresh? With freshness in general, the lighter the roast, the longer you wait, as the beans are denser and tend to take longer to degas. A good starter guide would be a few days to a week for dark roasts, as the beans are more porous and degas quicker. With mediums, I would say a week to two, and light roast can be anywhere between two to four weeks or even longer. As for the coffee being too old, well, you'll know because you'll struggle to build any pressure and it'll taste pretty bad and thin in the cup. At this point, if grinding finer isn't helping you, then you could try updosing if you have a bigger basket or just use it for pour over or some immersion brew. And if you really feel like committing a cardinal sin, then go make some cold brew. On a more serious note, different coffees age at dramatically different rates. So if you have a bag of coffee that's been lying around for months, try pulling a shot, it may surprise you. Much like us humans, the actual age and biological age can be very different. Okay, next we have processing. This is a really interesting one and is especially relevant with some of the crazy processing methods that we have these days. In very basic terms, processing is everything that happens to the beans from when they're picked to when they're dried and ready to be roasted. The longer this phase is and more intense the processes they go through, the easier they tend to extract when brewing. For example, if you have the same coffee as a washed and a natural, and you brew them with the same recipe, the natural should have a slightly higher extraction. Similarly, if you have a natural versus a 700 day thermal shock double fermented papaya infused coffee, the latter will likely kill you, but it will extract quicker. So take a look at your bag of coffee, check the processing method and keep that in mind when planning your recipe and brewing strategy. We have an entire video on processing coming up, so get subscribed so you don't miss that. And if you enjoyed this video so far, then a like would be amazing. We also keep forgetting to mention this, but another way to support this channel and help us continue making content on this level is on Patreon. Okay, back to the video. The last piece of information on the bag that I'd like to talk about is varietal and region. This one is trickier. It takes a lot of time and experience to understand how coffee from different regions and different varietals behave. Also, the same varietal grown in different parts of the world can behave quite differently. For example, an Ethiopian Gesha will extract differently than a Panamanian one. You may have also heard that higher density coffees are harder to extract. And while this rule is generally true for roast degree, it's not that straightforward here. I've brewed dense Ethiopian coffees that are challenging to extract and just as dense Kenyan varietals that are quite easy. It's an amazing skill to acquire, but one that's going to take you a while to hone as it involves drinking and analyzing a lot of different coffees from all over the world. How's that for a non-problem problem? Make notes every time you brew a different varietal and over time you'll start to see patterns. There's a really interesting blog post by Jonathan Garnier, which is very relevant to what we've just spoken about. I've linked to it in the description below if you're interested. Cool. Now that we know what to look for on the bag, Let's look at the variables of espresso and how this information is relevant to the dial-in process. Remember, espresso is brewed at high pressures, six to nine bars. And as a result, small changes can have a big impact in the cup. Things like dosing 0.5 grams more, letting the shot run a couple of seconds longer, or tweaking the pressure a tad can significantly impact the cup. So keeping that in mind, let's look at the most important variables when it comes to espresso brewing and how you can manipulate one or more of them in order to get to that God shot, if you will. First, we have dose, and this is the amount of ground coffee that you'll be using. To a certain extent, this will be determined by your basket, which is usually rated to a particular dose or range. For example, this is an 18 gram basket, and this here says 16 to 20 grams. These are both technically the same as most baskets, you can go a gram or two above or below the recommended dose. Also, the density of the coffee beans will dictate their volume when ground. For example, 18 grams of a light roast will take up a lot less space than 18 grams of a dark roast. With dose, I would say underdosing is okay if you're restricted to say a gram or two. Overdosing is generally a no-no, especially if the shower screen is touching your puck of coffee because this will lead to channeling. For the most part, you want to decide on a dose and kind of lock that in. I don't really ever change dose unless I'm using a grinder that doesn't have fine enough adjustments to get me to that sweet spot, if you will. Say it's a stepped adjustment dial and going one click coarser makes the shot flow eight seconds faster, which is way too fast. Then I have no choice but to fiddle with the dose. I could either go back to the original setting and lower the dose a touch to make the shot run a little faster, or I could stay at the coarser setting and increase the dose. Choose the option that requires a smaller change in the dose. Okay, this next variable I think has the biggest impact in the cup, and that's ratio. 
Once you've locked in the dose, it's time to decide how much espresso you plan to brew with it. So with a basket like this, you do 18 grams in and use scales to weigh the espresso coming out and stop the shot at 36 grams. Okay, so what is the right ratio? Good question. Let's go back to the bag of coffee. With ratio, the lighter the roast, the more water you need to extract it. So a 1 is to 2.5 or even 1 is to 3 is a good starting point for light roasts. If it's still too sour, then go longer or maybe increase the temperature. With mediums, start at a 1 is to 2. If it's too intense and sharp, go longer. If too much bitterness is creeping in, then go shorter, like a 1 is to 1.75. And once you're in dark territory, then use less water as these tend to extract very easily. Start at a 1 is to 1.5 and work your way down to a 1 is to 1 to pull thick, intense, gooey shots that aren't insanely sour. Again, going back to the bag of coffee, remember that processing method will play a role in your decision making here. For example, even if the roast is light, you may find that a heavily processed, funky coffee does better at slightly shorter ratios than you'd typically use for a washed light roast. The next one is grind size. And as the name suggests, this is adjusting how coarse or fine you want the grounds to be in order to achieve the tastiest extraction. This is probably the one that you'll be fiddling with the most to get your shots tasting the way that you want. Now, for a given amount of water, the coarser you grind, the faster your shot will flow, the less you'll extract. The finer you go, the slower your shot will flow and the more you'll extract to a point. As you go finer and finer, you'll get to a point where things start tasting awful and the extraction drops. This is due to channeling and is basically water finding parts of least resistance and flowing through those instead of flowing evenly through the entire puck of coffee. Now, no matter how careful you are, there will always be channeling, but it gets progressively worse as you go finer to a point where the damage that it's doing outweighs the advantage of having a finer grind and increased surface area. Okay, so how can we make the info on the bag useful here? Try this experiment, it's a fun one. Get two coffees, one dark and one light, and make sure they're both well rested. Dial in the dark rows first, and then without changing anything, including the grind setting on the grinder, pull that same shot with the light roast. Chances are, this will happen. Yeah, that's a mess. Like I mentioned earlier, dark rows tend to produce more fines and that helps them maintain puck integrity better. So you generally need to grind a little coarser for dark roasts. So when you go from a dark roast to a light roast, you'll need to grind finer to be able to hit the same kind of numbers. So once you get to know your grinder and which settings roughly work as good starting points for different roast levels, then you can do that quick visual inspection and crush test and you should be able to pull a drinkable shot in the first or second try. All right, next we have water temperature. And as a general rule of thumb, the lighter the roast, the higher the temperature you should be using. So if your roast is dark, then 80 to 85 degrees Celsius is a good place to start. Medium dark to medium, you can go up to 85 to 90. And with light roasts, you want to be 90 plus. With temperature, there's a catch though. Not all espresso machines are PID controlled and even the ones that are, most of them show you the boiler temperature, so you're not really sure what's going on near the puck. Frankly, this is the most annoying of all the variables and it's just something that you're going to learn over time using your machine. Different machines have different quirks and you're just going to have to use your palate to see where things are tasting the best. The good news is we'll be talking about how to taste espresso in the next segment. So stick around for that. So you may find that flushing your group head for like 10 seconds before pulling your shot cools the water down enough to give you really good results. This is called temperature surfing and the name is very misleading because there is nothing fun about this form of surfing. Not that I know anything about actual surfing, just looks really fun. With my proficiency in swimming, I could very well drown in a cup of coffee if I'm not careful. Temperature stability is probably one of the biggest improvements you'll start to see as you spend more money on a machine. But irrespective of what machine you own, you can use techniques like flushing to help you get to the right temperature, or with manual lever machines, preheating is essential. Okay, moving on, we have flow and pressure. Now, pressure is not a variable that you control directly. Pressure profiling is basically manipulating the flow in order to achieve a particular pressure curve over the course of a shot. A lot of you may not have access to these parameters, so I won't go too deep into it here. We've made a few videos that cover this in depth if you're interested. The links are in the description below. If you do have a machine that lets you fiddle with pressure and flow, then I would say wait until you're pulling great shots with a default flat pressure profile before you go tinkering here. It's gonna be tempting because it's definitely one of the most fun ones to play with and can have a pretty huge impact in the cup. Try pulling a flat nine bar profile, a declining nine to six bar profile and a lever style nine to zero bar profile with the same coffee and see how different they taste. It's pretty amazing. All right, next up we have time or brew time, which is basically how long the shot takes. Now, there are several opinions on when to start the timer and I'm not in the mood for a bloodbath, but I like to start the timer the moment the pump is engaged. 
Since extraction starts the moment water touches ground coffee, I think waiting for the first drop to start the timer eliminates a crucial chunk of the process. But that's just me. You do you, all I'll say is be consistent. Okay, time is an interesting one because it's one of those variables that you don't control directly. It changes based on tweaks made to other variables. For example, if a shot of 18 grams in and 36 out takes 33 seconds, then making the grind size coarser will shorten the brew time. Say that you dial in a coffee one afternoon and the shot takes 29 seconds and tastes amazing, then you have that as a target for the next time you brew that coffee. You then wake up the following morning and pull the same shot without changing anything and it runs a bit quicker then that's a good indicator that something has changed. It could be that your puck prep was a bit off or that it's a lot colder in the morning and the birds are behaving differently or you weighed the beans wrong and dosed a little lower. Similarly, say over the course of the week, you pull shots with the same beans without changing anything and you notice that the shots get incrementally faster and faster, then this is most likely the beans aging and you'll need to tighten up the grind size to get dialed in again. You get what I mean, right? So it's a really good indicator that something has changed and if it wasn't done intentionally, then you know that it's time to do some troubleshooting. Just remember to always taste before you go chasing these numbers. That morning shot that ran a couple of seconds faster may have well tasted way better than the shot that you thought was dialed in the previous day. Okay, before we move on, I want to quickly talk about this ideal recipe that you may have heard of. 18 grams in, 36 out in 25 to 30 seconds. This is a good starting point, but there's a catch. It's only really relevant if you're using a machine that's pulling a flat nine bar profile without any pre-infusion and has a 58 mm basket. Even if this is the case, it's just a very rough guide. Any other machine and these numbers are pretty useless. For anyone who owns say a Flare Pro 2, which has a 46 mm basket, you know that 40 to 50 second shots are the norm. So be sure to watch till the end because I'll be showing you a really fun exercise that'll help you start dialing in by taste. The next variable is puck prep. You don't normally see this listed as a variable, but I think it absolutely is. What you choose to do or not to do to your ground coffee before pulling a shot has a massive impact in the cup. With puck prep, you want to get so good that it becomes less of a variable and more of a constant. It is arguably the most important step when brewing espresso and it involves distribution and tamping. As for distribution, I recommend WDT. We've made an entire video on this linked up here and in the description below. So I highly recommend you watch that if you haven't already. The idea is to remove any clumps and level out the grounds in the basket before tamping so the water is forced to evenly go through the entire puck of coffee. The next step is the tamp. Here, you're compacting the grounds in order to create a dense layer of coffee that's capable of restricting the flow of water enough to generate six to nine bars of pressure. Tamping too lightly or unevenly will result in a shot that runs too fast and has the water flow through just one part of the bed. One way to not have to worry about this ever again is to get a good leveling tamper. These sit on the rim of the basket, ensuring a perfectly level tamp no matter what you do. I love the happy tamper and we've also been playing with the normal dose one that's really nice. These are quite expensive, but there are brands like Normco and MWH Bomber that make cheaper ones that work well too. If you're using a regular tamper though, just make sure that it's one that fits your basket snug and make sure that you practice your technique. You can check out a video by Chris Barker from years ago. I've linked to it below. And lastly, we have RDT. And you're probably even more confused by this than you were by puck prep. For those of you who don't know, this is the Ross droplet technique and is where you add a drop of water to your beans or spritz them before grinding to reduce static and avoid a big mess. Well, that was about it until a recent paper was published by Christopher Hendon and a few other scientists that showed that spritzing your beans not only reduced static, but also resulted in significantly slower shot times and higher and potentially more even extractions. Now, this test was only done on the EK43 grinder, but I thought I'd include it here as it's definitely a fun one to experiment with. I've linked to the paper below if you're interested. Try this at your own risk as it involves using quite a bit more water than just a single spritz. We don't know the long-term effects on a grinder when repeatedly introducing this much moisture, so you've been warned. Anyway, moving on. Okay, now that we've covered all the theory with the variables and the information on the bag, let's look at how to get better at tasting espresso with this super fun exercise. You may have heard of it or even tried it if you've attended barista training. It's called the salami shot and this too I learned from a Chris Barker video. All you need is a coffee that's sort of dialed in, it doesn't need to be perfect, and three empty cups. Then pull your shot and swap out a cup every 10 seconds and what you're left with is three different parts of the espresso extraction. Let's taste. This will be incredibly sour and salty and that makes sense because the acids and salts extract first. It'll also be super thick and viscous. The next cup will be a lot more balanced and sweet, 
less intense, less body, and quite enjoyable, but lacking a little vibrancy. The flavor compounds that contribute to the perception of sweetness tend to extract slightly after the acids, and is what you're experiencing here. It should probably be the most palatable of the three cups. And the last one here will be a little watery, slightly woody, and kind of drying with some bitterness. This is the tail end of the extraction where you're getting to a point where the coffee has given up most of its soluble material and is why it both looks and tastes more diluted than the other two cups. Bitterness is usually extracted last. Fascinating, right? Okay, what now? Well, now that you've tasted the three stages separately, pull a regular shot with the same coffee and taste it. If it reminds you of how salami cup one tasted, then you likely need to push extraction a little more by either grinding a little finer or letting the shot run a little longer or you could brew a little hotter. If it reminds you more of cup number three and seems a bit thin and drying or overly bitter, then you can try going a little coarser or stopping the shot a little sooner to lower the extraction. Lowering the temperature can also help reduce bitterness if that's the only thing that's bothering you. If your shot tastes like cup two, then you're in the zone. And at this point, it's all about making micro adjustments to try and get the most out of your beans. Or you could just stop tinkering and enjoy the rest of the bag. Do this with a bunch of different coffees across different roast degrees and processing methods. Just keep in mind that you may need to swap the cups out a little quicker for a darker roast and a little slower for light. Also, beware of light roast because that first cup will be so sour it'll make your teeth fall out. Think battery acid. So as you can see, this is such a great way to train your palate and it's super fun to do. I said this before, brewing espresso is pretty damn addictive. So immerse yourself in the process Taste espresso from various cafes from different parts of the world and practice dialing in different kinds of coffees and soon you'll be single. But you'll be drinking banging coffee. The Coffee Compass and Espresso Compass by Barista Hustle are also neat tools that can help guide you in your dial-in process. Wow, that was a lot of information. If you made it this far, then type espresso in the comments below. Yes, with an X so that I know that you're truly committed to this craft. Oh wait, I almost forgot the Easter egg that I mentioned because this video is like three hours long. And because we've packed so much information into it, we've made a cheat sheet that you can buy for just a dollar. It'll help support the channel and serve as a really cool, quick guide to everything that we've covered in this video. While espresso can be very frustrating at times and the learning curve is pretty steep, it's so much fun once you wrap your head around it. I hope this video helps you on your Spro journey and also saves you a lot of wasted shots. But now I'd love to hear from you. How long have you been brewing espresso? Did this video help you? And do you have any questions? Let me know in the comments below. And as always, thank you so much for watching and brew our arms safe.